Hi. A couple of months ago, we began our series on the conversion of turbochargers into turbojet engines. And if you're interested in that topic, you might want to take a look at those videos because I go into a considerable amount of detail on the principles, the terminology, the design, the assembly, the operation of one of these conversions. And today I'm just going to touch on some of the high points. The major caveat is that these engines are not well suited to produce raw thrust. And I know people have done it. Colin Fuse has done it, Morris has done it, a number of other individuals have done it. So it can be done. But when I say that it's not optimized, that has to do with the fact that there are a couple of very important physical principles that make these things not, not well suited for that purpose. Their first one is momentum. You have to momentum couple the exhaust and the vehicle in order to try to get maximum efficiency. And what that means, or how that impacts, is that you need to have the exhaust velocity from whatever you're using to move that air, whether it's a jet or a propeller, to be as low as possible. Now it always has to exceed the forward velocity of your vehicle so that you have a net zero momentum. But nevertheless, you want it to exceed that velocity as little as possible. And the reason that is, is that the thrust that's produced is related to MV, or mass, times the velocity of the exhaust. If you increase the mass, you'll increase the thrust. If you increase the velocity, you'll increase the thrust. But because the M and the V are linearly related to thrust, but the amount of power necessary to create that thrust is related to MV squared, as you increase the mass, you linearly increase the thrust. As you increase the velocity, you increase the power used as the square. So very quickly, the power usage goes up very, very fast. Now, as you can see, for example, if you took a regular, uh, say, a propeller or a jet, and you were to power a vehicle, and you wanted to double the thrust, you could, for example, double the mass, and you would double the amount of power you need. Easiest way to visualize that is you could just simply put a second engine on your vehicle. You would double the power, you would double the mass, but the velocity would remain the same. But if you took the same engine and you tried to get that doubling of thrust by doubling the velocity, you'd have to quadruple the amount of power that you need in order to do that. Now when you have a vehicle like a scooter or a bicycle or a little boat and you want to power it with one of these jets, that vehicle is going to be traveling at 20, maybe, maybe as much as 30 meters per second. But the exhaust from these jet engines can be supersonic. And so you're going to get an exhaust that's three or 400 meters per second. And that's a very poor coupling to the velocity of your vehicle. Now that problem is going to be less if the vehicle is traveling very fast, like an aircraft. However, these engines are not well suited for an aircraft ap application for two reasons. One, they're extremely heavy in their build because they're designed to be interfaced with an exhaust system from a, a, from a car or a truck. They have very heavy bearing housings. They've got cast iron components. And so as a result, it's very, very heavy. And in addition, these devices are not well suited to an aircraft because of the fact that the output and the input into the engine from the compressor and into the turbine are at right angles. So they're not aerodynamic. However, if what you do is you make a mo major modification and you change the scroll from the compressor and into the turbine into something more coaxial around the shaft, and you placed an annular combustion chamber within the gap between the two, just as they do with, say, an RC turbojet, you can produce a very compact, lightweight, aerodynamic engine, and that's why RC turbojets are such elegant machines. Nevertheless, this engine type does produce a lot of power. There's over 100 horsepower being circulated through this engine. And it's not at all difficult for you to extract as much as 40 horsepower from the output of this engine. And therefore, in order to be able to couple it more efficiently into a vehicle, we have left both of these engines, or mounted them, with these exhaust nozzles on them. We're not fully expanding or trying to convert all of the pressure that comes out of the turbine into velocity, we're retaining some of that pressure in order to be able to easily couple this into a turbine. And that's why the funny looking design on the back of these engines is because we never intend to use this just to thrust something. We always intend to use this to drive another turbine. Now, in doing this project, I learned a lot in the process of running this engine and found that there were a number of shortcomings in this engine. 
and because our intention is to move from this engine to a compound turbocharging system, which is basically series turbochargers. We're going to be using two compressors in series, two turbines in series to generate more efficiency and more power. In addition, we're going to be driving a big turbine and running a vehicle. So rather than dealing with all the shortcomings in this engine, I just went to the next stage and built this new engine and I incorporated a lot of improvements and I want to show those to you. The first one is that if you look inside the inducer of the small engine, you can see that with this pencil, I can rotate this pretty freely. It's not a lot of resistance to motion. But because this is a journal bearing and has more resistance, you can see that the dual ball ceramic ball bearings that we have in the larger turbocharger have much lower rotating resistance. Therefore, there's less parasitic losses in running this engine, even though it's bigger than this one. As a result, it's a lot easier to get this engine to, to self-sustain. Secondly, the flow resistance within the engine is based somewhat on the surface area inside the engine. As you scale the engine up, the surface area inside the engine over which all the high velocity gases are flowing does not scale linearly. The combustion chamber doesn't grow as fast as the inducer diameter. And so there's a little bit less surface resistance. In addition to that, turbulent, laminar, and especially orifice flow that occurs within the engine will actually drop as the engine increases in size, again, reducing parasitic losses. The bigger the engine is, the easier it is to get it to run. Furthermore, as you can see, this burner in the original engine is much shorter than the other burner. There's much more time for the fuel in the air to burn within the larger tube, and so it's a lot less demanding in the precision of the spacing and diameters of all the holes. It's just more forgiving for lower tolerances. It's easier to do. The other modification we made in this engine is you can see the input for the compressed air into the combustion chamber was placed at the end here. And one of our viewers had suggested that this is not an optimal place. And in fact, it is not. As you can see, because we blast air into one side, the burn tube has a very uneven burn pattern around its periphery because of that uneven blast that occurs with that tube. So what we did on the other engine is we moved that input from the compressed air backward, about halfway back along the combustion chamber, and to a point where it is intermediate between the primary and the secondary holes, and that provides a much more homogeneous flow around the primary holes, which are critical for getting a very even burn. Theoretically, it would be better to move it back even further, but for design limitations, it was, it was inconvenient to move it that far back. But this did do a good job in providing a much more even flow into the, into the engine. So as you can see, we have a single point fuel exhaust here, which is coming out in a cone. And when you take that cone and you spray it into the uh, flame tube, it takes a while for that expanding cone to mix thoroughly with the air that's coming in from the periphery. And that leads to a lot of burn instabilities that we discovered when we ran the engine. So what I did is I made a modification when I went to the larger engine. And what I did is on the main plate on the back of that engine, I removed the spray nozzle and I replaced it with a thin super alloy disc called Hastaloy. It has a much higher temperature tolerance uh, under an oxidizing environment than say the stainless steel. It doesn't warp like stainless steel. It's a bare to machine, but it's been fabricated with a small one millimeter gap all the way around its periphery. And so when this plate grows red hot inside the chamber, what happens is that the fuel as it enters from the back, then sprays or vaporizes, atomizes and moves laterally outward here. And that lateral spray then interfaces here with the input from the first primary holes of the flame tube and we get a much more homogeneous mixing. Now another little thing you'll also notice if you look at the side of this burn plate and the original, it's much thicker, three millimeters, six millimeters. The reason being is that when we go to compound turbocharging with this engine, we could get up to 60, 70 PSI gauge, puts over half a ton against this monolithic flat plate. So it went to a much thicker piece of material so that it wouldn't bow outward. Another thing that we discovered is that I was in love with liquid propane as a source for the fuel because we didn't need to use a fuel pump. Problem with the liquid propane is that when it flows into the system, we have to have a throttle. We have to be able to control it. And when you put a throttling valve somewhere in the line, you get a pressure drop across the valve. What that means is that certain settings, that high vapor pressure fuel 
will partially vaporize and form bubbles and you get this irregular spray of fuel, liquid fuel, gaseous fuel going into the engine. And it produces a lot of burn instability within the tube. A lot of people commented on what looked like surging occurring in that engine when we went to just pure gaseous propane instead of the liquid we found that all that surging and all that um, burn irregularity went away, smoothed out the flow. So we decided that we're going to use gaseous propane in this engine. And we're going to show you the first demonstration with this engine with gaseous propane. Little issue with that though is that the amount of fuel that this engine uses means that the evaporation of the fuel in this tank is occurring at a rate that cools the liquid off at about 5 to 10 degrees centigrade per minute. So with this engine and anything any bigger, this fuel gets so cold that the vapor pressure drops and over a couple of minutes we have to keep goosing the throttle in order to get the power to remain at a stable level. So the final modification we've made is that we're going to be going to a liquid fuel system, which we're going to demonstrate, which uses this pump and a, a basin of fuel and then we're a basin of fuel down there. And then we're going to go ahead and send liquid fuel up in here and see what kind of uh, efficiency this thing runs at. So those are most of the modifications with the final little adaptation that I did here, which is I semi-permanently mounted uh, a powerful EDF fan as a starter. And this is kind of nice because rather than taking this sort of leaf blower and holding it underneath my arm while I'm trying to start it, adjusting the fuel and looking at the gauges, it's kind of kludgy. This is kind of nice because I can just turn the engine up, get things to run, and then when we're done operating the engine, I can actually run this at a low level for a couple of minutes, cool off the insides, and within two or three minutes I can enter the chamber and inspect what's going on, so it makes it very convenient. So that's, that's the changes, that's what we've learned. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to put the parts together, install them, get everything set up, and then we're going to run the engine and you're going to see just how well it works. Okay, let's go. Turn on the power, we're going to turn on the pumps just the fuel pressure to about 20 PSI. Looks good. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn on the fan. You won't be able to hear me anymore after that. This thing is loud. The first engine that we built was really loud and you really had to wear headphones, but with this thing, they're critical. If you don't wear this headphone, when this thing is running at full power, it's like sticking a pencil in your ear. It's, it's, it's dangerously loud. It's just, <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. 
So I want to thank you very much for watching. And uh, like I said, we're going to be working on the, tur uh, the compound turbocharging as well as the uh, free turbine. And I'm not sure which is going to be in the next video, but both are being worked on simultaneously. So please subscribe because if you like this kind of uh, programming, we're going to be producing a lot more of it. So you have a wonderful uh, afternoon and so will we. See you soon. Hey, you want to run this thing up again? Let's do it.